Well, we're back again. And Ritu, you know, this time around, huh. I was reading something about the Vedic plants. And don't ask me why. Thousands sure. of years old. But turns out a lot of them have stood the test of time and yeah. only increased in their popularity. Hmm. Five of them stood out, or the five sacred plants as they call them. Hmm. We know it as neem, yeah. there is tulsi, yeah, there is that's coming jasmine, up. Yeah. and then there is sandalwood. Yeah. All these we know in commonplace products, be it toothpaste, yeah. tea, or you know, soaps, etc. Medicinal, Medicinal properties. Well. Yes. The fifth one caught my attention. If it's so old, then why is it that we don't know about it? And it's called Vijaya. It's strange, you know, you say it's not known because we know Vijaya as what, victory, as power. We don't really know it as an herb. Yeah, but, you know, maybe consumption of Vijaya would make you feel victorious or <laughs> powerful. We'll talk about giving that. Giving us a hint here. <laughs> giving you a hint here. I was reading a little about it and turns out that it is nothing but industrial, rather hemp as we know it. Yeah. And I thought, wait, if four of these are so successful, is there a market potential there? Well, that's exactly what we explore here on Mad About Markets. And if you're wondering why we're speaking of hemp today, well, remember our philosophy here at Mad About Markets. India's natural advantage in an industry, the industry's underlying demand drivers, the growth and further acceleration of growth because of these factors. That's exactly what we're going to discuss over the next 30 minutes. Yes, and let's take it away then from India's natural advantage in the hemp space itself. I mean, do you know that hemp cultivation in India dates back all the way around 5,000 to 4,000 before Common Era BCE, that is, our ancestors recognized its potential as an analgesic and antispasmodic and even as a construction material in the Elora Caves. No wonder it was one of the five magical Vedic plants. In this long history, actually gives India a natural advantage in the hemp industry itself. Now, you're looking at this leaf and you feel like, okay, maybe something <laughs> is amiss. So let's clear this common misconception. Hemp is not what you think it is. Unlike yeah, I mean, uh, we wouldn't be talking about what you think we're going to be talking about on TV because this is a legitimately huge industry. It indeed is. And unlike its naughty cousin, marijuana, hemp is non-psychoactive, it's loosely regula regulated and it's legal in most countries. Yeah. It has been bred to grow taller and contain more fibre, making it ideal for a wide range of applications, right from wellness to medicine to textiles and biofuels. Well, if it's still not very clear how the two are different, let me bring it clearer. Uh, you know, so how is hemp different from the rest? THC, which is a psychoactive component, that determines drug potency. Now, a THC reading of less than 0.3% in hemp differentiates it from illegal drugs. Now, the most common usage of hemp is through CBD, which is a compound in hemp used for medical and personal care products. The demand for hemp has seen a significant surge in recent times. For instance, during the pandemic, a lot of people turned to hemp products for its various benefits, which we outlined earlier, which fueled its adoption further. Now, Indian regulations have also started enabling research and medical cultivation, opening doors for further exploration. Also, the legalization of hemp in several global markets, including the US, the European Union, Canada, all of that has attracted players and investments into this sector. Hold on to that thought, Ritu. We talk about the regulations in greater detail in just a bit. But we have a bunch of guests with us. Uh, two of them joining us here in the studio, Yash Kotak and Chirag Tekchandani, the co-founders of Bombay Hemp Company. Thank you, boys. Welcome here. For Thank joining you for joining us, us. So Chirag much. and Yash. Thanks. Yes. And we also have with us Shreyans Kokra, who's the founder of Canva Loop, and Abhishek Mohan, who's the founder of Hemp Street. Interesting there, uh, Abhishek's hair. Did you match your dress with Abhishek's hair, Ritu? Well, uh, you know, we didn't really plan this, but I'm wondering if Abhishek is a fan of cotton candy and if there's or maybe he's flavored just, ones. Uh, okay, <laughs> well, let, let, let's talk about that in just a bit. But the boys in the white, we are uh, Chirag and uh, Yash. I'm curious about your shirts. You guys are wearing hemp-made shirts, you told That's us. Correct. That's correct, 100% right. hemp. These are made with, like, leaves. This is made from the stock of the plant, mm. which is the fiber, the yeah. outer fiber, which makes for great textiles. And, and this say is Cleopatra's first uh, clothes were ever made from hemp. And this is something you've just bought? It looks spanky, new, shiny. This is actually a four-year-old shirt. Um, I wear it uh, day in and day out every week for every important event, just as this is. And well, may I ask how expensive that is? That's about 2,500 bucks. And where do we buy it? Online. There's a uh -huh. website called belabel.com. We run a brand called Belabel. Uh, oh, that's enough advertising <laughs> for you. <laughs> Tell us a little about the hemp. I mean, you guys got into the business at a time where not a lot of people knew about it. Even right. now, it's mm. virtually unknown. How do you convince people and how do you tell them this is not the bad thing? Right. So, 
education is a huge part of our entire journey. Mm -hmm. uh, even the Bohiko's mission is educate, cultivate, elevate. Because when we started out, we realized very soon that people didn't only have to learn about something new, but first they had to unlearn and then yeah. relearn. Right. Uh, so for us, uh, and we, when we started out, we were setting up a whole industry, which means that we had to educate every stakeholder, the government officials, scientists, farmers, researchers, right? Because we had to bring all of them together for hmm. this to move forward. Yeah. Uh, so education was very bespoke, right? Yeah. When we went to the, the bureaucrats versus when we went to the farmers versus the consumer. But from a consumer point of view, uh, show and tell was the best way. When we used to write bhang ke kapde outside our stalls <laughs> at events, people would come in, they'd smell our shirt. And you know, those, those, I mean, it was a conversation starter. We yeah. never thought any question was bad per se, because at least we got to interact with the consumer. So that's a little bit about how we went about education. Sure, yesterday. but has it gotten easier doing business here? I mean, from state to state, how easy or hard is it to do business? So um, honestly speaking, we've spent over a decade in the business now. So it's mm -hmm. been 11 years. Um, I would say the law is very reciprocative of uh, operating in this space in the country. When we started out, the first white paper that existed in the country was that of uh, uh, a chief secretary of state of Uttarakhand that had written like a note on hemp and its potential benefits. Mm. Um, that was the starting point for Bohico. We mapped the regulation across different states, understood that this is a state subject. Every state is allowed to do what they would like with respect to cannabis or hemp uh, in the country. So uh, one state to the other, I think the progress has been remarkable. Mm. Uh, we currently operate out of Madhya Pradesh as a company. We manufacture most of our products there. Mm. So pretty conducive, pretty uh, reciprocative, I would say. Yes. OK, uh, hold your thoughts. Uh, Shreyans, let me bring you in as well. How did you come about uh, discovering him for textiles and, you know, what sort of uh, money are you making with it? Hemp provides a very good solution both in terms of water and carbon footprint, right? So it has probably the least water footprint among all textile grade fibers. And with regards to carbon footprint, based on the type of cultivation you do, it can even be carbon negative. So that's what propelled us to actually look for hemp as an alternate material in the textile space. Our uh, run rate at the moment, uh, we're doing we around, I would say 30 to 40 lakhs per month of business at the moment uh, in terms of fibers. That's basically the raw material for other mills for uh, making garments out of them. Okay, gentlemen, hold your thoughts because we're going to take a closer look at the elephant in the room, the regulations governing hemp in India. Now, while the flowering, the fruiting tops of the hemp plant, they remain banned under the Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act of 1985, the leaves, seeds and stalks are exempt. So there are parts of the plant that are legal and there are other parts that cannot be used. And, you know, if you talk about these parts itself, under uh, the law, we have medical cannabis, which is permissible and this is through a license you also have cbd oil manufactured under the drugs and cosmetics act that can be legally obtained and used and as per the drugs and cosmetics act legal hemp must contain no more than 0.3 percent thc any more than that makes it psychoactive as ritu had pointed out earlier as well so let's see how the regulations have been evolving from various stakeholders so for instance now in 2018 uttarakhand and uttar pradesh they had legalized hemp cultivation and farming then you move on to 2020 and by then Cannabis and derived products were removed from Schedule 4 of the Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs. Then, by 2021, the food regulator, the FSSAI, had allowed hemp seed, hemp seed oil and hemp seed flour to be sold as food or used as a food ingredient. And as we speak, hemp policies are under consideration in the states of Himachal Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh as well. So, uh, an evolving culture as well. I mean, the regulations are evolving along with the benefits of the hemp, of course, coming out. Yeah, they are evolving and the benefits specifically in the food bit interested me the most because if you're looking at the definition of a super food, hemp seeds definitely are there because they're rich in what? Protein, good oil, there's carbs, insoluble fiber. So if you just take a look at, uh, you know, the composition of hemp seed, it's 20 to 30 percent carbs, 20 to 25 percent protein, some percent of oil and insoluble fiber as well, making it perfect for usage in things like hemp protein powder, pain, stress relief a bunch of things that uh, you know the product could be used for well who knew all these benefits existed and that's why we're doing it here on mad about markets on that note i'm going to go back to you abhishek 
you know, does the regulatory environment for both hemp and pharma limit the scaling of your products? And what is the lab-based efficacy of what you're selling? Absolutely. I mean, if you're trying to solve a problem that in a pharma kind of standard, yes, you have to deal with what you have to deal with because I think end of the day, it's patient safety. So like, for example, when we started the company, we, we, I mean, it was a much easier, there could have been a much easier way to go to market, but we, today we track, you know, being from India, which is probably the smallest market today and in the legal cannabis business, uh, we still built out a robust blockchain based uh, tracking system to know that you know, where our products are being sent to which doctors. Now, we did this because we did not want to be what the opioid crisis was, what opioids are. If you're trying to change something, you've got to be better than them. So we developed that. The second is we only sell via doctors. We don't sell to patients via our website. It's been, obviously, it's super tempting for anybody that wants to scale their business, but that's not the responsible thing to do. You cannot sell it yourself. It has to go through doctors. Uh, you know, it, we don't directly sell it from our website. We only sell to doctors because we think as a prescription product, it has to be prescribed by a practitioner and just be bought by a practitioner. Even though we get a ton of, if you look at our traffic, we get a ton of consumer traffic, but we have to turn them away. So we welcome, uh, similarly, we just kicked off a clinical trial with the Amrita School of Ayurveda, which is a gold standard. And it's an extremely strict protocol. It's the world's first uh, polyherbal solution for dysmenorrhea, which is a proprietary formulation that we have. And it's going to go over nine months. And it's, it's a proper clinical trial, which really even, you know, there's very few people around the world that are doing it. We're doing it because we want to build something that solves, right? So I think if people, some people look at regulatory as a nuisance, I look at regulatory as a way, as a necessary way to pr bring out the best, uh, you know, uh, best uh, quality product for the patients. Right. Uh, Shreyans, uh, what are the regulatory challenges you face and what's the change uh, that, you know, you need to grow more? The fact that for non-edible hemp, right, so when we are growing industrial hemp for, say, fiber or for herd, the THC limit that's set for cultivation, if that can be done away with, because it does not make logical sense to have that THC limit when we are not having the bud or the seed even germinate on the crop, right? So the THC would come on the bud or the seed. So if you're not letting that happen, uh, it will definitely increase domestic cultivation if we can do away with that limit for fiber, uh, for hemp grown for fiber or herb. Well, we often talk about uh, investors and startups sussing out opportunities much ahead of everyone else. So on Mad About Markets, when we talk about the hemp industry, it's attracted some really big names and exciting startups as well in this space. And the biggest of them all was Ratan Tata and uh, ex-Google Rajan Anandan in 2017 invested in Bohiko. That was one big deal that brought attention to the hemp industry as a whole. It showed their belief in its potential as well. Following soon was uh, Hindustan Media Ventures, which invested in Hemp Horizons in 2020 itself. And very recently, Zerodha founder Nitin Kamar tweeted his conviction to allocate some capital to hemp-focused startups. And speaking about startups, we have a bunch of them in India. Hemp & Co, there's Hemp Stroll, there's Green Jams, Hemp Street, Satleva, Hemp Republic, and so many more driving innovations in this space itself. And by 2027, it is projected that there could be around 500 companies working in industries related to hemp in India itself. So that's the big opportunity we're talking about, Ritu. And let's take it to where, you know, they're really selling this <laughs> e-commerce, right? Uh, we often talk about that here as well. The e-commerce opportunity for hemp products, that is booming, especially in the last couple of years. So, you know, It's Hemp, an online marketplace that has emerged as one of the key players and offers more than 2,000 products from licensed cannabis manufactured in Uttarakhand, from hemp-based food products to cosmetics, textiles, you have pet care, you have construction materials. I mean, you name it. You wouldn't have imagined that these kind of products can be made. And they are available at a click of a button, catering to the growing demands of conscious consumers. Well, a lot of startups, a lot of investment, a lot of products going to e-commerce. So what does all of this eventually boil down to? Let's zoom out and take a look at the global hemp market itself. The Asia-Pacific region currently dominates the industry, accounting for nearly a third of the overall market share in 2022 itself. The United States, with the establishment of the U.S. domestic hemp production program, has also become a significant player. The global hemp market is on a remarkable growth trajectory. In 2023, Ritu, it was hmm. projected to be around... $10 billion, $9.5 billion to be specific, and this could skyrocket all the way to near $60 billion by 2031, representing a staggering compounded annual growth rate of nearly 25.5%. So, 
a 10 billion dollar industry going yeah. all the way up to 60 billion dollars. Well, that's a global opportunity. We still don't know how much of that is going to translate into an India opportunity. So we're going to ask the players, Abhishek, uh, what's been the funding like for the industry so far? How much more is still on the sidelines? Done. So you, there's zero institutional funding right now. Uh, so we've, I mean, obviously every VC knows who we are by this point because it's a sexy industry. I mean, at the end of the day, hemp, cannabis, everybody wants to read about it. So, uh, well, I can speak for the guys who have raised, raised a decent amount of funding, which is me and the lads at Boheco. Uh, I think they raised somewhere in the north of six and we've been somewhere under three. They've been around for 10 years, we've been around for four. So we've raised money from, uh, not from, like no institutional money has gone into, like no VCs have invested in it. Everybody's waiting on the sidelines because they're waiting to, there's so much other, like for example, Indian, the Indian VC ecosystem, it's very rare that you see them investing in something that has not already been done in the West, right? So in India, while we are federally legal under Ayurveda, it's very hard for people with LPs in the US to process that it's not exactly like the US market, which is recreational. So I think it'll take some time, but, but we're seeing a lot more interest Actually, on that note, uh, you know, Yash and Chirag have been standing by patiently. Let me invite you back in. And, you know, we've been hearing about the players, about the kind of investor interest there's been. And you guys have been one of the first ones to get funded in a mega large deal. But uh, I want to understand eventually at the end of the day, the investors want to know how much money you're making. So give us a sense for Boheco, what the revenue has been like, what profitability is like. So we've actually scaled up closer to 40x since the first round of capital that we raised in 2015-16. Mm. Um, we're doing about um, a 50 lakh monthly run rate as of now. Mm. Uh, we aim to close this at about uh, eight and a half crore this financial year. Okay. And uh, the idea is to be growing a lot more post that. And does once that we... uh, flow into your bottom line as well? Are you guys profitable right now? No, no at the moment we're not profitable. Uh, but we aim to break even at the end of 14 months. And majority of now. your revenue comes in from? From the health and wellness business. Now, what would be the biggest cost? I just wanted to understand from an expert's point of view. I mean, um, is it education awareness, customer acquisition, your relationships where? So the idea is to build um, the category at large. So uh, in terms of changing perception is the largest cost or deployment of capital. Okay. Over and above that, we have to uh, have the right kind of talent come in to be able to grow the business. Before we let you go, running yes. out of time, just yeah. three words that Ratan Tata said to you when he was... I mean, how do you get that, man? How do you get Ratan Tata to invest in you? Well, I guess he's a visionary. He believed in the vision that we had for hemp. And one thing that he said to us when we were with him in a one-on-one -on -one was that this idea really excites me and, may, and he wished that he was a lot younger so that he could contribute a lot more. Well, all that is well and good, but I heard a different story about how you got <laughs> to speak to Ratan Tata, but maybe that for another time. Uh, we have to take a short break but don't go anywhere because you know we have a lot more to talk about for instance the bigger question the bigger question that's what it boils down to is the indian hemp industry finally over the hump or yeah. are there a lot more hurdles out here in fact by the time the boys are here might as well ask them you know quickly what do you think the hump or hurdles, hurdles. what are the um, I mean, what are some of the hurdles to get through to really get to a higher growth trajectory? Well, like he mentioned earlier, right, awareness and research are mm -hmm. the backbone for this industry to thrive. Yeah. There is a lot of awareness happening, but there's still a lot more to do uh, because India is typically conservative and there's a myopic view yeah. attached to the plant. And the other is research. Science hasn't kept up with policy, though there is a conducive policy for certain states to work with. But there's a lot more research to do. Uh, before we can prove the... How big do you think the India opportunity could be if the global opportunity is roughly 60 billion? So we're living in a country with a 4,200 crore pain relief market. Every one, one in every seven Indians is got arthritis. Um, so the idea is to be able to at least penetrate into 5% of that market using alternative medicine. Hmm. And um, to add to some of the hurdles, um, institutions are yet to come to terms with... Uh, investing in this space but mm. um, the need of the hour is bold capital bold and patient capital to be able to take unconventional bets and that All is right. something that india needs to see so very more soon. educational awareness and for investors to take bigger bolder bets into the market on that note we're going to thank both of you for being here and take a very quick break but don't go anywhere we're back in just a moment